Hi everybody, it's Lynn Louise Wonders again, and today I have a very special guest. This is Sarah Feinberg. She's located in Israel, and I've had the honor of having consultation time with Sarah on and off over the last couple of years and have realized her to be a really special resource for our community because she treats special populations that a lot of people don't have a lot of experience or training with. And one of those is in caprices. We're going to talk about that. One is, um, another is medical trauma. Um, and so Sarah, I wanted to give you an opportunity to tell everybody who watches these videos a little bit about what you know first about treating in caprices. And first let's define in caprices for people that might not know what it is because a lot of therapists encounter this never having heard of it. So why don't we just start there? Sure. Um, yeah, so encopresis is it's a very challenging uh, diagnosis. It's uh, when children, it's usually after the age of four, have fecal soiling. So sometimes it's called soiling. Um, sometimes it's called encopresis. And basically, they're having accidents, um, bowel movements outside of the toilet. So it could be anywhere, uh, in their underwear, not in their underwear, and it's it's difficult. It's difficult for for families and uh, for the kids. It happens in school, and yeah. It's, so sometimes, uh, um, um, and maybe you can speak to this. Um, I've had a couple of clients over the years that retained their bowel mm, movements, yes, and um, so they developed really chronic bad constipation issues. It became a medical issue, which kind of comes over to your medical trauma background. I can see how these could be tied exactly. together. Um, so is that something that you see sometimes as well? Exactly. So typically, um, encopresis is a result of constipation. So the question is, what is happening to make the child constipate? It could be a medical issue, or potentially it could be an emotional issue, which then led to the medical issue. And it's sort of intertwined, so it's sort of hard to know what came first. And sometimes it's hard to say what came first. Some parents will say, oh, my child's always been constipated from when they were one, two years old. And sometimes, like you had mentioned, it's them holding in of their bowels. So then we need to know why. Why are they doing this? and how can we help them? And so the first step is really to get to know the child and the family and understand what is causing this encopresis. And what I always say first is it's very, very important. Actually, the first step I should say is the child must be seen by a pediatrician and a pediatric gastroenterologist, it's very important to rule out any blockages, any possible medical issues. We really want to get that taken care of first. And also the doctors can tell us what medications will help. So it's a real combination of medical and emotional and behavioral. So then the next step, yeah, the next step then is some type of behavioral program. And that's where I work with the parents. Um, work with the parents on a schedule. These children need to sit on the toilet a few times a day, and that needs to happen. It's usually 20 minutes. It's recommended 20 minutes after a meal for five to 10 minutes. And we work with the parents to see how the child can be comfortable sitting on the toilet, make it fun, have some games, blow some bubbles, um, do something to make it not such a scary or difficult process? So, um, oh gosh, I have so many questions. <laughs> um, I know that you use play therapy and you use art therapy. You are an art therapist, a board certified art therapist. Um, and you also, we've talked about play uh, based interventions, play therapy in com combination with art therapy. And in a few minutes, I want to ask you about interventions. But first, I want to kind of stick with this clinical sort of case conceptualization and considerations. So yeah. how, in your experience and in your knowledge, it, do you see um, correlation or cause and effect um, connectedness with sexual abuse and incapricis? 
So I've definitely, the research definitely does point to that at times. Mm -hmm. um, in my experience, and I've had a, many, many cases over the years, I have not seen that to be okay. the case. Mm -hmm. um, what I, I know it's definitely a possibility and that needs to be ruled out and explored as well. And I usually keep it in the back of my mind. Mm -hmm. But typically, I haven't seen that here. Um, it could just be the cases I've seen, but each yeah. case is so different. So I don't say um, there's one cause. Like, for example, it could be a regression. Mm -hmm. So maybe the child has a big move, and that caused the regression. Maybe it's a sibling was born. That caused the regression, and it caused them to hold it in. Because if you think about it, Children don't have a lot of control in their lives, especially the little ones. So what do they have control over? When they go to the bathroom, if they go to the bathroom, that's what they're controlling. And sometimes it's it's the power struggle. This is, you know, what I want to do and I'll do it when I want to do it. And then if they don't realize how it causes them pain afterwards. And then it becomes this difficult cycle of they're experiencing pain. So they decide, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm just not going to the bathroom. So we have to work on that. So it depends. I have some children who are just real sensory kids and they can't stand certain smells in the bathroom. Yeah. So we have to really address that too. So it's really getting to know each child and what is causing this, this holding in of, the vowels. Wow. So I know that you've written an article on your website and we're definitely going to link that article below so people can go and look at that. A lot of people like to read and you know have that information mm -hmm. in writing. And you were telling me earlier that in that article you do address four areas or four yeah. uh, realms. Why don't you talk a little bit about that and then they can go to the article and read all the details. Absolutely. So yeah, so it's the four prong approach. Um, so the first is medical, like I had said, and then the behavioral, as I mentioned, the schedule, and then it would be a plan for maybe accidents at school. And it's not really behavioral in the typical sense. We sometimes think of the tokens that kids will get rewards. It's not that. It's more about working with the parents on how to set up a schedule and a reward system but I don't, I typically like to do it where they're giving verbal praise, yeah. not so much the, the little things because the kids don't respond to that. Um, so yeah, so it's more about, more about that type of behavioral approach. And then the third step is the psychoeducation, which is so important. And that sort of brings me back to my days in uh, where I worked in the hospital where we explained to children before they had surgery what would happen. And just like that, I explained to children what happens in their bodies when they eat and how the, the bowels work. And that's so important so kids understand. And I do that through art projects, through videos. There's a fabulous video we could link. It's called uh, The Poo in You, and I have a book. Um, this is... Uh, it's called It Hurts When I Poop, and it's a great book, and it has, look at this picture. Mm -hmm. Can you see that? And that's really important to explain to kids how our bodies work. Mm -hmm. So they really understand, and once they understand, they can become part of the process, and they're not as resistant anymore. And then my last step is really the emotional um, interventions, and that's what I do here, you know, in, in the playroom through the sand, through the art, through the play. Um, and it's interesting, sometimes the kids, uh, I'm pretty much client-centered for the most part, but then I do introduce interventions as needed, like similar to the way you work, Lynn, um, prescriptive um, approach. I find typically it works so well, especially with this population. Um, and what I've seen is so, so, so interesting. Um, a lot of the kids in the sand get things stuck. I have, <laughs> I have this, my little tunnel, mm -hmm. and it's amazing how much gets stuck in this tunnel with the children who have ankylopresis. Um, little cars and little trucks cannot get through. 
and get buried and stuck inside. And really they're externalizing their process, their issues yeah. through the sand. So one thing I just want to emphasize because it is so close to my own heart that you have said is I heard you say several times about how important it is to really get to know the client, to get to know the family, to, un to build that connection and rapport. And the reason I want to really emphasize this to anyone who's listening, I'm sorry, I talk with my hands, um, <laughs> um, is that a lot of times therapists who are newer and they're looking or kind of feeling desperate to find, oh gosh, how do I, how do I treat this case that's landed in my lap? They will tend to listen to a video like this or, you know, hear about the interventions and jump to the directive behavioral piece um, without taking the time to make sure that the relationship has developed. So this is the tricky part because when you have a case like this and the symptoms presented are so, um, I mean, so they need, to, they need to be addressed because they're in pain and there's, you know, and you have to rule out the medical first. And I know you have to address the behavioral, but I have a feeling that you have a very special way of weaving in the child-centered piece. And I'm curious about that. So if you could kind of, if you were teaching um, newer therapists how to make sure that that piece is there, and, you know, and not skipping over that connection between the therapist and the child, because I would think that that really will lend to the trust needed for the child to begin to relax within the relationship, to then begin to relax enough to be able to, you know, overcome the incapricious. How do you do that? Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. That's really, I think, such an important piece that does often get overlooked. Um, so the way I work pretty much with all my clients is the same beginning, and um, I let them know I spoke to their parents because I always do my very um, significant intake first uh, with the parents and I let them know what their parents are concerned about. Their parents love them so much and are worried about X, Y, and Z. In this case, it would be, I would say, sometimes you have pooping accidents and your parents are worried about that. And we're going to try to work really hard to help you with that. But first I'd like to get to know you and play with you and do some art. And then I show them around and I said, you get to choose. You could choose whatever you'd like. Um, and that's the way we begin. And I really try to be authentic in my approach. Um, and for some reason, I think kids pick up on that. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's just my interaction with them and I, I sort of, <laughs> I'm good with the nonverbal cues and the nonverbal expression. I feel like I'm reading underneath. It's like the subtitles. Yeah. Um, and so you I think that. I'm oh, sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. No, no, that's, that's. I think that's pretty much how I how I build that relationship first. So, so important. you're working with the child in a child-centered way in the beginning to develop that rapport and that trust yeah. and to give them. Um, you know, an experience of feeling empowered and free to make choices, which is so important mm -hmm. with the in caprices because a lot of times it is a power issue. Right. And then I would imagine you're also going to be working with the parents and parent consultation sessions. That's where the behavioral yeah. piece comes in, where you're exactly. guiding them on some directives so that your interaction with the child is not so directive but at first, but your work with the parents outside of the child sessions is going to be directive and psychoeducational. Absolutely, absolutely. And especially like we mentioned, the power struggle, that is the piece we really work on um, to sort of mitigate that. So it's not an issue anymore, really. And, and I tell parents all the time that they need to get support for this because it is such a difficult, all encompassing problem. I hear from them all the time that just dealing with this problem every day is exhausting. Yeah. It's so hard. Yeah. So you also have a background, just want to mention this real quickly. And as you kind of mentioned, you worked in a hospital setting, you are a former um, child life specialist. Um, so you were working a lot with children who were um, going to be having surgery. And I imagine also after surgery. And so you, now you work with children in your private practice where sometimes they have had medical trauma. Um, and that's an area of specialty that a lot of therapists 
ask about in my Facebook group, um, you know, for resources. And so um, I want to talk a little bit about your availability to therapists for consultation, because I know you have, you have art therapists um, or people who are working towards their board certification in art therapy as supervisees, but you also do case consultation for therapists who are working with children using play therapy, probably primarily um, all over the world, um, and you're available um, in these consultations. What might people um, um, anticipate or expect from having a consultation with you about one of these kinds of cases? Yeah, so I've met with people all throughout the world, which is, um, I really appreciate hearing and seeing people from all different parts of the world. And yeah, it definitely, um, case consultations, sometimes it's typically about encopresis or medical trauma. I've had um, people consult with me about dental, dental trauma and how to help the child they're working with um, get more comfortable going to the dentist or getting their immunizations, mm -hmm. different things like that. And now with this uh, new pandemic, we're all dealing with um, the concern that I've been thinking about children everywhere um, are having to deal with a whole new, new type of trauma. And the creative art aspect, um, you know, under the umbrella of, of play therapy, creative and expressive arts are part of what we do in play therapy, but we're um, in, unless you are an art therapist, we're not art therapists. Um, and I find that it's very helpful. I have you and I have another art therapist in Connecticut that I work with um, that are, are such a valuable resource to the play therapy community because you have that special extra, extra level of training and expertise in utilizing art as a means of expression and healing and growing. So I just you know, I, I assume that in consultation, sometimes you might be able to help therapists who aren't necessarily trained in art therapy know how to do certain interventions or activities. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. And it's something that, like we said, so many play therapists do such wonderful work and the arts are such a fabulous tool to connect to children. Absolutely, it's, it's a great, great resource we have and happy to, happy to share. <laughs> so um, real quick before we um, wrap up, you mentioned before we got on here that you might have some, a couple of interventions other than that awesome book you showed us that you would yes. like to share. Yes, um, absolutely. The first is, and I had a few um, kids give me a lot of feedback, a balloon, a balloon when um, sitting on the toilet will really help them, first of all, it helps, as we know, with the breathing and the relaxation, but it also helps them figure out how to push, push out the bowel movement. It's so important. So I highly recommend it. I've had kids tell me it was like a turning point for them sometimes. Okay. Um, yeah, another one. I have a cute little, this is something I made, but I always have kids, um, I have it around, I have uh, clay that's white clay or brown clay. Mm -hmm. But most of my clients who have ankle creases choose the brown clay <laughs> and they enjoy making poop. So uh -huh. this is a little poop man I made <laughs> and you can decorate it however you want. But it's really, um, and it's fascinating. I could write a whole nother article about how children choose this brown clay, they roll it and then they plop it in the water. Um, and it's interesting because it's something they do over and over and over again. And it's as if they're, they're externalizing the problem again, but they're also working it through and they're actually doing it. And for some kids, that's a turning point. So that's a really nice um, intervention as well. And I so I always recommend the brown, the yeah. brown clay. I love it. Also, the use of the sand tray. And of course, we always want people mm. who, who hear this to know that it's very important that they get sand tray training um, in particular. Don't just do, go jumping into sand tray therapy. But having the sand and having the yeah. items and being very child-centered yeah. with it can in and of itself be where we could just use our child-centered skills um, to just allow whatever happens in the therapy to happen and just observe that and know that they're, sh they're giving us a window into their inner world um, when we get to yeah. observe and playing in the sand. 
Yeah, and sometimes for kids, it's about a fear, um, a fear, like I mentioned, of the toilet or different bathrooms. So I also have, I make a little chart. It's like little exposure therapy. I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but this is a really... Ooh, upside down. Uh, yeah. Yucky bathroom. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> yes, that's lovely. Lovely. <laughs> so everyone, you know, it, it's good to bring humor into it. Um, but it's it's that's our goal. Our goal is to be able to go into that really, really yucky gas station bathroom. And so it's exposure therapy for, for kids and make it fun and enjoyable. Um, and we do that with, sometimes we uh, use different creams that smell okay, smell nice, and then they smell that before they go in so they can handle being in not such a great environment. Interesting. So yeah, you're so using another there's little... some sensory um, components to this, it sounds like, with the clay and the sand and the, and the aromas and then the imagery um, for some yeah. exposure. Yeah. So you kind of walk them through that and let them feel, kind of imagine and feel how they'll feel at that time. So there's some somatic awareness to this too. There's that piece, right? Just really getting to know their own body signals. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So we do a lot of mindfulness techniques also. Uh So they can really think about how, because a lot of these kids, they're not, they're busy. Sometimes they have attention issues and they're very busy doing things. They don't have time to go to the bathroom. It's not so fun. Um, so we try to have them take a minute and be a little bit more mindful. Yeah. It sounds like, yes, treating incaprices requires a, a very prescriptive approach because you're having to look at what is going on with the client in front of you and then pull from all of these different things and address all these layers. So, um, Thank you for sharing this with us today. So what I'm going to do is, um, for everybody who's watching, is link um, Sarah's website so you can get in touch with her. If you want to do a consultation, you want to read her article, we'll link that below. Um, And then if you have anything else, Sarah, that you want me to include, I will definitely do that. But thank you so much for your time today.